The following interview was conducted with our electrical engineering alumnus, Frederick S. Cooper III, for the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections Oral History Program. Fred attended Purdue on a full football scholarship and was a three-year starter for the Boilermakers and elected defensive captain in his senior year. He was also the first black student athlete to hold that position. Fred was one of the founders of the local chapter of the Black Society of Engineers at Purdue that in turn was the founding chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. His current role is as a commercial real estate broker for the Brookshire Hathaway Home Services and he lives in New Jersey. The interview took place on April 19th, 2018 in West Lafayette, Indiana at Purdue University. The interviewer is Tasha Zephyrin. Hi, Fred. How are you Hi. doing? Hi, Tasha. <laughs> so to begin, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, I grew up in the Chicago area. I was actually born in Chicago, grew up in a, a south suburb, attended one of the more well-known high schools in the south suburbs. Uh, Thornton High School. I have two other sisters. Uh, one of my sisters also attended Purdue. Ever since I could remember, I always wanted to be an electrical engineer. That was even before I knew what an engineer really did. I sort of came to that conclusion just by tinkering around, taking the radios apart and putting them back together you know, while I was growing up. And uh, I also you know, was also involved in sports. One of my uh, passions growing up, besides tinkering with you know, technical gadgets, was watching Big Ten football. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have fond memories growing up watching Big Ten football with, with my father and my grandfather on my mother's side. But we were actually a, a sports family, you know, still still are, where we, you know, my mother even to this day still watches, you know, football and, and other sports. So. <clears throat> Went through, went through grade school and high school. I also had a proclivity toward math, so I looked out on that. I didn't realize engineering was so much math until, until <laughs> later, <laughs> right when I was getting ready to go to college. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was graduating from high school, my dream was to play major in electrical engineering and to play big time football. So before I actually came to Purdue, I was actually recruited by a number of colleges, including three Ivy League schools. I, but again, the reason I chose Purdue because it had because of its reputation of a top engineering school, and I could also play big time football, and also play in the Big Ten. And so I went through. I came to Purdue. I, I came to Purdue in 1970. Uh, that was, you know, there was a lot going on back then. You know, it was a lot, a lot of minorities were trying to get in uh, white colleges, so that was one of the, the main thrusts that um, we were we were trying to get done. And <clears throat> played. I started my freshman year playing football, and then my sophomore year I joined the Black, it wasn't. It was just a group of us, about fifteen of us. We didn't have a name at the time. We were just, just a bunch of, you know, black folks trying to help each other out. One of the problems we were up against back then is a lot of people were coming into the program. Unlike myself, they didn't necessarily have the coursework to complete the engineering program. But it was hard anyway. So when we first formed the group, the well, it was a simple mission. There must have been about 15 of us. You know, tops. I think it was one woman, as I remember. <laughs> and then um, it was just to help each other out, just help each other get through the program. So that, that's how it started. And then we decided we wanted to become recognized on campus as an accredited organization. So we you know, came up with a plan. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that because we wanted uh, the university to sort of take ownership in our success. So we, myself and Ed Barnett, who was actually served as the first president, we set up a meeting with the Dean of Engineering at the time, who was Dean Hancock, and we went over 
and had a meeting with him and you know, told him what we wanted to do, told him a little about you know, what we were about. And the first meeting, maybe the, I think it was the first couple, first meeting he said no. <laughs> he said we needed to do more to, you know, to be a fully recognized organization on campus. He wanted us to you know, develop a charter. He wanted us to elect, elect officers. And then he also wanted us to meet for three or four months to make sure that you know, we really had a viable group. So we, we went back and we did all of that. We, we elected officers. Uh, Ed Barnett served as the first president of uh, the group back then, Black Society of Engineers. I served as the second. Uh, I served as the second president and was president for two years. And so we went back to. We may have had to go. We may have gone back to to Dean Hancock, I think three or four times before he actually said that we he was going to give us our our due and be recognized on campus. That allowed us to. That allowed us to have access to university resources, and and again, so we wanted uh, Purdue to be have some vested interest in our success. So, it, so the organization grew. You know, as time went on, we sort of we, again our, our focus at the time was just retention. Back back when we first started, we were going through like a ninety percent dropout rate. So we were trying to make sure people graduated. Mm -hmm. In fact, that became you know, one of my mantras, and it <clears throat> basically that everybody who came into the program you know, will graduate. And that, from my, personally, that came from me growing up, and that was what was instilled in me uh, from, from my parents you know, growing up in the Chicago area. And so th that was our main focus. We were also trying to recruit more minorities into the engineering program. Mm -hmm. And then as we progressed from sophomore, junior, and senior year, we set up, we first set one of our first things we did in terms of after college, we set up a resume book that we distributed to, to the companies that were planning to come on campus during the recruiting seasons, you know, in the fall and, and in, the, in the spring. So we put synopsis, we put our resumes in a book and a synopsis of our, our, you know, of us individually. And then we sent it to companies before they came on campus so they'd have a, already have a summary of who they were going to interview. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's how we progressed. I graduated. That's a big overview. Ah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's a really good overview. And actually, yeah. before we go um, a little bit further, like I'd like, there were a lot of interesting things that you were bringing up there. Uh -huh. And so you were talking about, you know, growing up in the South Suburbs uh -huh. and the affinity, so you're in a sports family, affinity for all the, um, like, building radios and all that kind of thing. Uh -huh. But how did you specifically, like, I knew you decided to come to Purdue, but what was, what was the impetus? Was there anyone else involved in that process and you actually ending up at Purdue? Uh, actually, that's a good question. You know, when, when I um, left my senior year in high school, I actually started my junior year, I started being recruited by a lot of colleges. And again, I always said I wanted to be an engineer. Purdue was a school that I had picked out uh, even before I started being recruited by high school. So back during a full rec recruiting season, I had narrowed it down to three schools. One was Northwestern Purdue. Uh, Wisconsin was also in the running. They had a good, they had a, a, a they had a, you know, a good engineering program, but their athletic department, their secondary, only played three deep. So that's why I sort of ruled out uh, University of Wisconsin. The only reason I, I ruled out Northwestern was because I thought it was too close to home. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now, growing up in the Chicago area, Northwestern was, I was on the south side, Northwestern was on the north side. It was mm -hmm. still only like an hour away. But the thing I did like about Northwestern was the coach. Alex Agassi was the coach at Northwestern at the time. It turns out if his fate would have it, after I decided to come to Purdue, uh, at the beginning of my junior year, uh, Agus, a Alex Agassi actually ended up at Purdue anyway. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Never, never would have thought that. Mm -hmm. that. But that's sort of how I actually ended up at, at Purdue. And besides what I said before about wanting to play big time football and uh, go to a top engineering school, I actually applied to Purdue during the fall of my senior year in high school and actually 
got early acceptance in November. Uh, that was actually before the recruiting season actually started. Uh, you couldn't recruit in high school until after your senior year in terms of going to visit colleges. Mm -hmm. But I had already applied to Purdue early fall and gotten an acceptance letter in November before, uh, right when high school football was ended. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I ended up at Purdue. And you mentioned there was a big push towards getting underrepresented minorities to attend Purdue. Could you tell me a little more about that? Uh, that, that? That was more, that was, that was, in terms of, um, that was, had to do with, again, if you think back during that time, I was, I think I, I've always reflected, I went to college at the perfect time. I, I went, we were going through, I went through two different social changes. One was affirmative action. Uh, with the civil rights movement, and then the other was the anti-war movement. So that was really what was going on. Uh, <clears throat> I was more pushing toward the um, the civil rights movement, trying to get in, just trying to get accepted into the colleges that we wanted to go to. Back during that time, the civil rights movement was the impetus. The colleges, all colleges at the time, started setting objectives to try to recruit more minorities into their programs. Mm. That's what I meant in terms of the timing. And then right after that, the women's movement sort of piggybacked right after that, you know, two or three, two, three years later. So it was a it was everything was lined up and, you know, and it, I got in, you know, I'm sure because of, you know, somebody else's efforts, um, you know, before me. But everything was lined up in terms of it was a perfect time to, to start the Black Society of Engineers, mm -hmm. because if the colleges was more, uh, we, we were putting a focus on it, but also colleges were more amenable to it then, or the, actually all the society was. Mm -hmm. Was college a big um, goal for, you know, or an important thing to achieve within your family? Oh yeah, it wasn't, it was, uh, it wasn't if we were going, it's, <laughs> we were definitely going, it was still a mess right away. There was no other option. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, a funny story. My youngest sister, who act, who also attended Purdue, she, you know, back when I have another sister who she she didn't come to Purdue and she didn't major in engineering. But my youngest sister, she kept saying back in high school she wanted to be an airline stewardess. Okay, so my parents said, well, no, you, you got to go to college. So she goes, I don't know if I want to go to college. So they finally said to her, okay, well. This is the deal. If you, uh, you can go to college for four years, graduate, if you still want to be an airline stewardess, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you were going. Right. But yeah, my family, especially on my father's side, they, they were what we call overachievers. So it was never a question of if I was going to college. I may not have ended up at Purdue. Uh, as, I, as was stated before, I came on a fo full football scholarship. But mm -hmm. I would uh, I was going somewhere, either the University of Illinois, or you know maybe could have been in state. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely. Did your parents attend Purdue? Or? No. No. Okay. No, my parents didn't attend Purdue. I had an aunt that attended Purdue. Oh, okay. Uh, Dolores Shockley. Oh. Well, okay. Well, it was Dolores Cooper at the time. Oh. Okay. And she was, uh, got a PhD in pharmacy. Okay, that's the name yeah. I was thinking of. Right. It just occurred to me I didn't yeah. know which way that went in the yeah. family tree. Okay. Yeah, that was my father's. Uh, uh, sister, she actually got a PhD at Purdue. Oh, excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're now at Purdue, and you're mentioning. I mean, so you're in the middle of civil rights era, and all this mm -hmm. stuff is going on, mm -hmm. and you're a black male on campus. <laughs> <laughs> what was the campus environment like at Purdue during that time? Uh, I, uh, yeah, my, it was. I was, I was living the dream. So, it was. I, I didn't feel any any kind of any kind of, I, I didn't feel uncomfortable, but it's always been pointed out to me that I was in the football program, so that was, that maybe that shielded me from a lot. Mm. That, uh, but I was, again, I was doing what I wanted to do, so I didn't, I had, it was a, I look back, it was a, it was actually a good experience. I do, uh, I did sort of, you know, through the NSB program, I did, uh, Black Society of Engineers at the time, I did get more in touch with what other people's challenges were that I didn't necessarily have. Again, I came on a full football scholarship. You know, people just coming in engineering, but 
besides getting into the school, you know, financing their degree for four years, you know, was a challenge. Mm -hmm. So they, some other people may, may have thought about it differently. But it was, uh, it was a great experience. One thing I had to get used to at Purdue was, I thought, it, you know, living in West Lafayette, it wasn't what I was used to living in Chicago in terms of things to do. But I came to understand later it was, it was a blessing because there were no distractions. Mm. You know, it was, it was <laughs> well, a perfect environment. Mm, what yeah. were some of the differences between Chicago and West Lafayette? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a big cultural difference. Not necessarily, it's cultural difference in terms of Indiana and in the Chicago area. Uh, diversity wasn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't, Purdue wasn't as diverse as it, even as it is now or even if, as it was when I, when I left. So, again, I was on the football program, that's, and I didn't, I, I wasn't, I didn't party, you know, my, I, I would come out on the weekends, but during the week, not only did I study, but I had to study. Mm. Yeah, if I missed a day studying, I, I'll be, I would lose three days because it would take me two days to get back to where I was, just breaking the concentration. So I got into a, a, a I got into a good a good routine. Uh, one of the in terms of study study habits and, and playing football. Uh, one of the things that I talked about after I left, I would come back to Purdue and give talks to high school and even uh, grade school students mm -hmm. that you can play sports and still major in engineering. So, but you know, it takes discipline. Mm -hmm. So, but I had developed discipline uh, through high school, grade school, and high school. But uh, that was one of the things that uh, uh, I would tell people too. A lot of people were were shied away from uh, being in a technical degree and wanted to play sports. There's a funny story around that, and that is, you know, I was recruited by these number of colleges. So. Once I said I was going to come to Purdue, and I said I wanted to major in engineering, they invited my parents down you know, for a weekend to meet with the athletic department and people in the engineering. So we came down, it was one Sunday, we were having brunch out at Morris Bryant, it's, it's not there anymore. So I didn't know it at the time, but the athletic department had contacted somebody at the Cranet School of Business, and we had to go to eat breakfast. He was, the person was sitting there, and, and I heard one of the coaches say, you know, talk him out of it. I didn't know what, he, I didn't know what he was talking about. So I went down, so I went, to was in the, at the, the next table, I went down and started talking to him. And he was trying to talk me out of being in engineering. I said, he said, are you sure you want to, you want to do that? So this, this is a true story. I was looking around, maybe he has the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I'm, no, my, he, he said, well, it just take a lot of time, you know, this and that. And <clears throat> he didn't talk about being in engineering, but I thought that was, the athletic department also didn't want me to be in engineering because they thought it would take too much of my time. And they probably, I think they also thought my grades wouldn't, you know, be at, you had to have a C level to, to be eligible to play football. So I don't think they thought that uh, I wouldn't be able to do it. Were there other engineering students who were athletes as well only at one, the time? Only one that I knew when I, while I was playing that uh, it was, uh, Tim Rackey, he was he was a year before me. He he was an engineer. He wasn't a minority engineer. Mm -hmm. He wasn't wasn't in that. Okay. There's only one though. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, me being two. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, did you just sort of put your foot down, or how did you end up? You know, still. No, I, 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 I like I didn't know. I act like I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> so I went back. I went back and after we left, I went back. We, we, my parents talked about it. They were they were sort of insulted. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't insulted because I didn't. I, I didn't. I, I wasn't listening to him anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so you're living the dream. You have yeah. your college degree paid for. You're playing football yeah. that you love. I will have to <laughs> say, you know, I didn't appreciate a free education until after I got out. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, came, I came from a camp. I, I still have, you know, there's a debate being, been going on for a few years now. Should college athletes get paid? I always felt that I was playing football. That I was, I was doing something for the university. That, you know, they make my scholarship back in one weekend. So, mm -hmm. so I didn't, I, I didn't appreciate the the value of free education after I graduated. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a full appreciation of it then, because I felt I was, yeah. I, 
it was it was intense. I mean, I, I was you know, it was a, during the season. It was seven day a week, you know, proposition where I'm, you, know, you study during the week and uh, on home games they put you up in the hotel on Friday nights and you play the game on Saturday, mm -hmm. and then Sunday you come in for a meeting. And, uh, and when you uh, away games you travel on Friday, and then play the game and come back, you still get up and do something on Sunday. So it was it was seven days a week. So it was, you know, this wasn't, and again, I was in engineering, so I, I was studying every every night. Mm -hmm. I was also involved in, in the Black Society of Engineers. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a busy man. Yeah, <laughs> it, it sounds so. Well, you mentioned that some of yeah. that discipline or work ethic you had learned yeah. as a high school student. Right, in, in grade school. In grade school. Can you mm -hmm. tell me a little more about that? Well, my parents, I, uh, they instilled a lot of it in it. But some of the activities that I was in in grade school and high school, I was in the Boy Scouts, you know, so I, I was accu accumulated some, some merit badges. But the thing that actually actually gave me you know, discipline that really made a difference is I was in a band in grade school. I played the clarinet and also played the saxophone. Wow. But the instructor, she was, she was a disciplinarian. You had to practice five hours a week. You had to get it signed by your by your parents mm -hmm. before you go back. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the band. She she ran it more like a, a military, <laughs> but we had practice during the week at like I think it was seven thirty before school mm -hmm. to get up, and then she also required us to be in a contest. We played in a, in a regular band, and but we all had to try to compete for a, a solo contest. So we always went to the, the district and the state level. So you had to memorize a, a song. So that was that's actually where I got a, a lot of my discipline. Mm, okay. Yeah. Did you? Then I got I got out of it in high school because I was playing football, and mm -hmm. I couldn't be in a marching band. Okay. When I was in high school. And so besides the financial advantage of being. In, uh, and, you know, and playing mm -hmm. football. Mm -hmm. Did they provide any additional academic support? Or was that totally on your own? You mean the, the college? The well, yeah, within the football program oh, or yeah, as part yeah. of your scholarship. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, they, the, the football program, the athletic department, they would uh, supply tutors for you if you needed them. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think I ever, uh, I, ne I never asked for a tutor. But again, a lot of again, you know, by my sophomore year. We had, I was part of the Black Society of Engineers, okay. and that's sort of we we were helping each other. We we, we formed study groups, mm -hmm. so we were getting we were getting our support, you know, from each other. Right. But yet, but the school did, uh, athletic department did pay if you needed tutors. Okay. Yeah. So how did the idea for the Black Society of Engineers first come about? Like when did it? Uh, again, we you know, we we were having study groups and we. Um, we just said we wanted to be recognized on campus because we need, we needed access to like you know, uh, conference rooms and, mm -hmm. and and resources, and we said the best way to do that would be to we had to be we had to be recognized on on campus. And the we was like there were just well, black yeah, engineering students who were there at the time. Right, just black engineering students. So you know, again, me, uh, Ed Barnett, and our are the ones that actually founded it. Mm -hmm. But it was it was other people there too. You know. You, to Chicago Six, the Chicago Six, they came a couple of years later. Right. Yeah, the, it was. Uh, they had they had assigned one uh, one key figure in that too was Arthur Bond. He was he was like our sponsor, or he was a faculty. He was he was a PhD from Purdue, mm -hmm. and he uh, he was like our he was the person that was assigned to us as our angel by the university before we actually formed the group. As your angel. Yeah. It was like our mentor and right. sort of like tutor, I guess. M more like a mentor. Okay. See, part, part of um, <clears throat> one of the things Northwestern had too in Purdue, a lot of the um, when minority, even black athletes came to any uh, most predominantly white school, mm -hmm. one of the things that a lot of some of the, they set up, um, they set up uh, like a, I guess like an angel, like a counselor, somebody where, you know, minority students could uh, go, could go, okay. mainly just to just to make the transition from high school to college, mm -hmm. and make the transition from a, a to, to mostly white college. So mm -hmm. we had the, similar as you know, like the Black House, that was so where we could congregate. A lot of a lot of the a lot of the uh, schools, 
lot of the mostly white schools set up had uh, people who were playing that role. Mm -hmm. um, it just turns out Arthur Bond was just he he, he played that role for engineers for you know, they, we had the Black House when I first came. That was for the minorities at large at Purdue somewhere somewhere to go. Okay, and it's a social outlet and to you know and to you know talk about the issues they were having and what, what kind of problems they were having. And but Arthur Pate, he he played and he was our sort of an ab advocate at the in the School of Engineering. Uh, level. Mm -hmm. okay. you, know, you know, if, if going through Purdue engineering, it wasn't if you were having problems with something, it's, you know, what was it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What kind of problems yeah. were they? Well, the biggest problem was, the biggest problem was, is it, in hindsight, was you know, people were having problems with their classes, their roommate, their professor, their, you know, they had a bad game. You know. So one of the things that we, another thing we we uh, tried to focus on was it's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of you know, a lot of when we first started, a lot of I, I suspect a lot of people did make it through the program because they were afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. So that was the other thing we we sort of created an atmosphere. It's okay to write. It's okay to ask for help, and we know you're having problems with something. So we <laughs> just tell us what it is, so we can help. So mm -hmm. we can help each other. So that was a, that was a big that was a big initiative too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Arthur Bond again. He he would come to our meetings, and so we all we all you know developed. We, we all developed you know different you know, leadership styles. Uh, Arthur would you know give us a, a taste of reality. Myself and and Ed, you know we you know we, you don't have time to feel sorry for yourself. Okay, mm -hmm. I, you know, I I was coming from the football mentality, and I'm you know no matter whether you got a a bad call from a referee, or you made a mistake, and you got 40 seconds to get over it. Be lined to everybody for the next play. Mm. So you know you just you know it's, you got a bad test. Okay, you know, keep going. Just get a, you know do better next time, mm -hmm. and just take each you know, so each play at a time, you know, or, right. or each day at a time. You know. so what was what? Can you give me an example of what would be a taste of reality from Arthur Bond? <laughs> uh, well, mo mostly, mostly. I don't have a, I guess mostly, I don't have a specific example with a specific person, but it, it all centered around uh, somebody trying to feel sorry for, for themselves that they got a bad call by, by a professor, that uh, they got a bad grade and they somehow they were trying to blame the professor. Mm -hmm. That either they didn't give them enough time or they didn't explain it right or something was on the test they didn't talk about in, in lecture, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But it mostly was... I mean, it was just a symptom of, you know, some people just trying to feel sorry for themselves. Okay. So it was really just more, you know, I mean, it was really more of, I mean, w everybody listens, but you, know, you could you can't, you couldn't, you couldn't wallow in sorrow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, the, the program's going to pass you by. Mm -hmm. Just like I had mentioned to you, if I, if I went out, if I didn't study one day, I mean, I, <coughs> As you know, in a technical degree, what you learned yesterday, you're gonna to apply today. And if you don't have what you should have learned yesterday, you can't you can't keep going forward. Mm -hmm. So, so that so that so that was my you know that was my sort of perspective and right and but but my in the back of my mind my the, the thing that was driving me the, the thing I was in terms of my leadership style was you're in the program you're gonna graduate you're gonna fight through all the obstacles. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, football, you know, gave me a lot of that, you know, discipline and that perspective. That you know, you always have a defense on football, right? <laughs> <laughs> Offense doesn't just walk down the field, right? Right. <laughs> There's always somebody trying to stop you. Okay, mm -hmm. so you got you got to pet, you got to you got to get past the obstacles and get it get into the end zone. Mm -hmm. And that was my. <laughs> Nobody's just gonna stand stand by and just give you the degree. <laughs> We came to understand later, you know, you know, all these obstacles; those were intentional. We're trying to see how you work through problems. <laughs> mm. So that—that's, you know, I tell people that's the one thing I uh, learned from engineering. I learned a lot of life lessons from football too, but the thing I learned from engineering it teaches you how to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So that's, so that's the thing you come out on the other end 
you know, right. you can solve problems. Okay. And then um, just talking a little bit more again about sort of the formation of the Black Society of Engineers. Mm -hmm. And so why did you feel that there was a need to have this specific group, mm -hmm. like a formal group? Mm -hmm. um, I think besides trying to give the university accountability, it also gave us accountability mm -hmm. in terms of, okay, now we have this group. Then it becomes, you're not just just obscure person in a, in a big university, nobody knows who you are. Now we're a recognized university, so we sort of were holding our, each other. We started, it also, it also helped us hold ourselves accountable because mm -hmm. we, aren't, you know, we aren't somewhere off where nobody knows who we are. Mm -hmm. you know, people do know who we are now. And that, that motivates you know, people. But then you know, then it just. But then we start seeing progress. You know, once you see progress with anything, then you start building the momentum. Mm -hmm. And then that's sort of once we got past uh, probably the first, the second year, when we you know people were coming out at the other end. We started focusing on, like I say, the resumes and the interviews on mm -hmm. campus, te helping each other interview. Then it started building on itself, and. We had started seeing more minorities coming to the program, mm -hmm. yeah, more women, more minority women. So then it then it sort of started feeding on itself. Right. And then of course the big uh, when Anthony uh, Harris and the Chicago Six, I, I was gone then when they formed the mm -hmm. uh, actual national organization. And then it really took off. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's like who knew? I mean, no, nobody knew. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely coming back to that in a second. Yeah. Uh -huh. But you also mentioned then that so you and Ed as sort of driving thought leaders want to bring this idea to the dean to get support. Mm -hmm. Did the two of you decide, like, oh, we need to bring this to the dean, or no, what, did you what, have help from Art Bond, or how yeah, did that oh, yeah, work? Oh, yeah, Art Bond was, uh, yeah, yeah, remember, nobody, nobody's singly successful the way Nesby's success. Everybody yeah. played a role, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, but that's, that's it. Everybody still, everybody still has a role to you know, keep moving it forward. Mm -hmm. now, everybody played a role, yeah. It, uh, uh, Arthur didn't go with us. It was just me and Ed who went and met with him. But we had uh, the small group we had. Yeah, we we talked before. Me and Ed went first. Okay, I don't remember the exact detail. Me and Ed had talked about it personally. Mm -hmm. Then we came back to the the small group we had and said, "This is what we want to do." So we yeah, we we exchanged some ideas. Okay. Uh, they didn't. No, we didn't really know until we met with them first. You know, when, when when Ed and I went and met with. Uh, Dean Hancock, he gave us these marching orders about you know, former charter, uh, elect some officers to meet. Then we came back to the group and explained. Then everybody sort of pitched in. We pitched in writing a charter, and then we held elections, and then we sort of made sure we came to all the meetings. You know, the <laughs> so Dean, so that the initial meeting with Dean Hancock, where um, it was, it was essentially just, like come again, was yeah. it? Was it more? Him? Yeah, we, we, yeah, we weren't prepared. We didn't. Okay. We didn't know. We just said this is this is our vision. This is what we we like to do. We didn't, and we didn't come with a vision. We didn't come with officers. We just it was like sitting down talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. This is this is our vision, and then we you know, we we had talked a little bit in terms of how it can help the university. You know, which is, again what was going on at the time. We mm -hmm. we can be a focus, and you know, we I don't know how much we talked about uh, the benefit of diversity in terms of. You know, diversity and thinking. I think we were just talking about uh, how to get more more minorities into the engineering program. But no, we weren't. We weren't. We weren't prepared the first time. We didn't. We didn't have any. <laughs> we just had an idea and a vision and a, I guess, and a passion. Mm -hmm. And then he told us, and he, and he he gave us a dose of reality. <laughs> so this is what you have to do. It, it all made sense when he, you know, once we left. And then we came back and. We talked about with the. It was, I remember it, it was a lot of work writing up a charter, and that's. So that's what I say. It was. It wasn't like going back the second time or the third time. We had to. Mm -hmm. We had to craft. We cracked the charter, so it you know made sense and something mm -hmm. that uh, the university could see a benefit in. Mm -hmm. But to his credit, uh, you know Dean Hancock was a. You know he he, you know he he embraced it. So he didn't. Even though he said no, we weren't ready, but ultimately he embraced it. You know, he he began to see the value in it uh, as we went on, and he sort of again. I I can't make this point enough. Everybody, you know, no one person that really was one person singly 
the successful finesse be success. It was, mm-hmm. you know, everybody, everybody, the founders, you know, the, we played a role, you know, just keep it going. And the Chicago Six, all, the, the university administrators, the deans, everybody has played a role. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, how, how long was important. that process? Yeah, like it was still going on to me. Mm-hmm. It's still going on. Mm-hmm. One of the things that, uh, you know, I, gave, I don't know if you were at the talk, but I gave a talk when I, I think it was, was that September, I think it was a couple of years ago. It was it was some core things that made Nesky successful, mm-hmm. and one of the things that we were having a hard time recruiting when I was when I was here was I mentioned before a lot of people a lot of students say they want to be in engineering but they didn't have didn't have the um, didn't have the, the the courses so one of the things when I left I start I was coming back to Purdue uh, coordination with Marion Blaylock at the time give talks to grade school and high school students. Mm-hmm. Not only could you major in engineering, but <clears throat> we, for, we first started just focusing on high school, but then we opened it up to also to grade school and junior high students because by the time they got to high school, it was too late to start taking courses your junior year. So we tried to get uh, junior high students uh, interested in the technical field back in high school, and that's one of the cornerstones of their program right now mm-hmm. as, as part of the Nesby Junior program. The Nesby Junior program? Yeah. They have it, or the Minority Engineering program? No, the Nesby Junior is, is uh, they have high school. Yeah. Yeah. Out, mm-hmm. And they also have, um, they also have teachers, I don't know, I think it's in the grade school, yeah, the grade school, some of the grade schools too. But mm-hmm. I think it's mostly in the Nesby Junior program, it's mostly high school. But it still brings in grade school. They have the, like the workshops they have in the summer. And Marion Blaylock was helping Nesby she, develop that, or uh, uh, Marion Blaylock is was is is the Virginia Booth's role now. Mm-hmm. They yeah once they skin, uh, um, Arthur Mom was our initial angel, mm-hmm. but before I left Purdue, Marion Blaylock that role wasn't there when we first formed it. Right, that was, that was I think maybe two, maybe three years later. Mm-hmm. She was there before I left, but it may be only one year. But that was the same role that that Virginia Booth is playing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the organization saw a need to right you know, put uh, make that a position. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, like, so thinking back to now, you have approval from Dean Hancock. You mm-hmm. have your charter, your constitution. Mm-hmm. You have your faculty advisor, and Art Bond was the faculty advisor, right? Right. Correct. But mm-hmm. he was. Uh, PhD sh- candidate at the time. I think he, he may, I don't know if he was a candidate, I thought he already had his PhD. Okay. He, he may have been a candidate, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I know he was a, he wasn't a full professor at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the reasons he left. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then, so you had your, you ended up with your first meeting, mm-hmm. and according to some records, the first meeting was Octo- October 11th, 1971. Right, so, about that. so could you tell me a little bit about that first meeting? Oh, like, okay. bring me to the meeting, can <laughs> I see it? <laughs> I don't know, actually, I don't remember the details of the meeting. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we were, we were, I mean, again, we were, uh, you mean the, the first meeting, that was the first meeting. Of your Black Society right, of Engineers. Right. Well, we were, <laughs> the thing I remember about going through the meetings is, is, you know, who am I going to fit this in? So a lot of people were, <laughs> you know, you know, it was October 11th, I just come from football practice. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so that, that was, you know, that was, that was a challenge. You know, the first meeting was, we were trying to, we were trying to get focused in terms of everybody was having problems with something, but people were having different problems. Mm-hmm. So we, we were, I'm sort of coming back to me now that I remember, we we sort of you know, talked about different issues people were having, and okay. then we we sort of set up, um, <clears throat> you know, for people could set up times to study together. Not there at the meeting, but we would talk about, uh, you know, if, okay, next you know next Thursday, why don't you and so and so meet and go over math? Why don't you and want somebody else meet and go over physics? You know, whoever, depending on where you were. In in the, in the program and what you were specifically having problems with, most of the time back then it was physics. It was <laughs> that was the freshman physics. It and still is. I mean, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was the front out for us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people, a lot of people, if you got to see this, you know, forget about this. Don't even worry about this. Keep going. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that 
I remember, yeah, I remember physics was a, was a big issue, but, but it was mostly, you know, we were still, you know, we were still really trying to organize ourselves, and it was really more of a, you know, support group, you know, that's why, that's really what, that's really how Nesby started, it was really just a support, mm -hmm. and then we had, yeah, we had some, forward, we had some forward thinking going on, you know, we mm -hmm. were, we were pushing, but again, remember, we were, we were just trying to keep people in the program. Right. That was our number one goal because mm -hmm. we were we were just trying to get people just you know, out the other end. Right. So that was a lot of our, our initial focus, and at the same time, you know, keep pushing. Like like for example, when we started the uh, resume, we said, okay, I'm a senior this year now, but <laughs> <laughs> so at one of the meetings, okay, let's one of we just came with an idea, let's right. form a resume book. We can send it to the companies that are scheduled to come to uh, to recruit during the recruiting season. Mm -hmm. It, it was mostly, again, we, we had some, we had some forward thinking going on, but, you know, but, you know, we were still, you know, we were still, you know, we were still mostly focused on uh, retention. Mm -hmm. And we was trying to, we sort of, we were sort of nibbling at, at recruiting. We were, like, when the minority came on campus, one of us, somebody would talk to him, and we would, that was... We didn't really have a big initiative recruiting mm -hmm. because we, we didn't we were we were trying to stay in school <laughs> we were and we were sort of looking forward but that's it's sort of we started saying what we what could we do in terms of getting more minorities in there right and most of a lot of it that had to do with being a role model you know I, I became a role model in terms of what I that wasn't sort of my intention but that you could play sports and you know come to a in, in major in engineering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And did the did you all hold the meetings in a classroom on campus or? No, it was a yeah yeah classroom or empty room. You know, it, it was on campus. Okay. Yeah, they were um, they more like conference rooms. I guess if I remember, mm. they weren't like recitation halls. They were more like we had tables. And you were. And they weren't always in the same place. You know, we had to have to see. That was the issue about being recognized on campus. We had to. You know, we sometimes they were. Sometimes they, I think I remember they went to the library, you know, initially, because mm -hmm. we couldn't get a couldn't get a room at the time. Okay. Yeah. And then during that first meeting again, you were elected vice president. Yeah, the fir yeah, first meeting when we had elections, yet uh, Ed was the president, mm -hmm. the first president, I was the vice president. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then how did you like throughout the rest of your time at Purdue? So you were vice president that year. Right. And yeah, when the you president the next year. President the next year. How did you manage the <laughs> the leadership, like I know you mentioned, it's a struggle, but yeah, that's why I, I just got into. Uh, I would say I had to. You know, I just got into a like a rhythm. You know, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't. Everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, well, football took a lot of time <laughs> during during the season. Mm -hmm. But we we had a time block, so. You know, we had all our classes had to be over three thirty, and we practiced from four to six, and we had training table at six thirty. So by the time I was ready to do anything, it was seven seven thirty. Mm. <clears throat> That's when my, you know the night started. <laughs> <laughs> the next shift yeah. of work. <laughs> right. Okay. So it was you know again, um, it was. So yeah, doing that those early leadership. When I was doing that, I was again mostly, you know, the, you know, you know my, my sort of message to the group was, you know, you can do it. You know, you, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we were still doing, you know, setting up study groups. I, I really didn't have a chance to make a lot of the study groups because I was planning or studying, you know, planning, studying individually, which didn't, it didn't coincide with the times the study groups were. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> mostly it was, I remember just, you know, we listened to what the issue, what problems people were having, and you can do it, you know. And I got the reputation, they said, I'm saying, aren't you having problems? <laughs> I, I just never, I never complained about it, you know. I, I, I'm not that, I'm, I don't complain in now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, this is life, this is what you, know, it's just, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so that was, I think, Again, I came to understand more. I was more leading by example than I was mm. anything I was specifically telling them. Right. You know, I was, you know, I was telling them. 
I wouldn't put it the same way I put it to you. You got 40 seconds to get over it, but (laughs) (laughs) you know we were listening. But okay, but okay, but now what you now now what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. But we we all we all you know you know you know when I was a vice president when we all you know the leadership all developed this thing you know know, this is reality. Come on, you know (laughs) you can't complain. You know you I got a bad you got a bad call. You got a we say, okay, go talk to your professor. You know, <laughs> you, know you don't think you you would treat him as fairly, but yeah, you know, but also, you know, keep in mind, um, you had this keep this all in context back then. Again, you and you have a lot of minorities in the mostly white college, so it wasn't just academics either. It was being, you know, just a, a, assimilating or getting acclimated to college life. Mm-hmm. Right? So it, all that was going on too, or you know, a lot of people didn't like their roommates. You know, okay. We, you know now you guys you gotta be able to get along with people, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so all that was going, everything was going on. So, mm-hmm. so it was, you know, it became a. Um, in some case, I'm gonna, I'm say like a refuge, but it was. You know, you. You in a room with somebody, you, you feel you have them in common, yeah, in common, where you you wouldn't admit that you would have a problem in the classroom with everybody else, that you would admit to it uh, among us. And we, mm-hmm. and we, we, you know, we, it's like any kind of organization, close organization, and it was small, so it was we, de- we developed, uh, you know, trust with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So all that, all that, all that was going on. <laughs> so beyond like roommate issues, were there other social challenges that members were facing? Um. Well, I found out later. I wouldn't. I was was the financial issues, mm-hmm. and uh, because. They were give they were given scholarships then, but they were, a lot of them were dependent on having a certain grade point average. Even though it may not have been a academic scholarship, but still dependent on had some kind of great GPA component. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, girlfriend issues. You know. <laughs> I mean, everything is just <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, meeting. You know, having time to. Having time to you know, have a social life, you know. I had roommates who could go out and party every night. I mean, that didn't really affect me. I know, it, I know it affected some people. Even like on the weekends, you know, engineers, you, know, you, you, you couldn't be out partying all the time. So a lot of just we see people on campus when they were out, you know, going to parties. But when we, so that was part of it too, just trying to have a social life. I mean, that was some of the issues that some of the other uh, students had. Some of the other engineers had. Mm-hmm. And was it general social issues just because of academic discipline, or was it even some of? Because from what I can imagine, there might be some race issues going on with who hangs out with who in a social environment. Was there any of that happening? Um, I think I think I didn't feel that. Mm-hmm. Again, you have, you have to, I'm I'm acknowledging this. I was in the football culture. And it's, football culture is different anyway. I mean. With some of that going on uh, at Purdue, again, I was we we heard a little bit about it, but it wasn't a big problem. I can't can't say it was a big problem at Purdue, but I'm sure I'm sure some other students that weren't involved in the football program uh, may have felt that. What was the football culture like? Well, football culture is always sports culture is always we we tease each other about uh, racial issues. You know, we, <laughs> you know, we make you know people will probably tell you this, but we. You know, we, we've always made fun of all the stereotypes of society in the football, but football is, you know, it's, you, you develop strong bonds there too, because you see those people seven days a week, mm-hmm. and you, you know, you want to want to battle with them every every week. So you don't have any choice but to trust somebody next to you on the football field or any kind of sports endeavor, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. it's, it's truly a, a team sport. Mm-hmm. It's a mess. It wasn't just Purdue. It's that's a, right. that's a sports sports culture, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, like from your perspective, that you could see, because I know you're busy a lot. But how did like other students, faculty, or staff on campus sort of respond to the Black Society of Engineers, like as it's now existing? Oh, oh well, it, uh, uh, it, it we got a positive response. Okay. Yeah, we got a positive response. It wasn't. Uh, a lot of people, 
Well, a lot of people didn't didn't know it. A lot of people didn't know exactly what we did. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm probably saying some things now that people that weren't in it probably didn't know what you know, what we were really doing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we we got uh, we got a, a positive response, especially as we, as we got recognized on campus. And, and, and positive response in at, what way? At the uh, at the uh, mostly in the uh, I'm gonna say the, the the black culture. I can't say I, I didn't see any I didn't see anything negative in terms of in the the white culture, mm-hmm. but in the negative culture, we go to the black house and socialize and study, and everybody everybody you know even the you know the, the fraternities everybody was was supportive of each other mm-hmm. back then. Okay. Yeah, what I didn't. You know, there weren't any any negatives. Mm-hmm. There's no no negative energy around it. Right, and then so I know you mentioned this a little bit before about how that so you you graduated in I think fall of 1974. Right, December. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah in December 1974, mm-hmm. and then during that time is when Tony Harris and Chicago Six are sort of transforming from Society of Black Engineers to National Society of Black Engineers. Right. Is an annual banquet, the Nesby publication, the cornerstone, <laughs> right. a cornerstone, sorry, uh-huh. and all that starting to happening. But so, how involved were you in your final semester, or what's your knowledge or perspective of those events that I know are like now starting to right. happen? Yeah, I uh, graduated in December 1974. Uh, I could have stayed another semester on the on scholarship. It, it offered me another semester. I decided not to. Tony and the Chicago Six, uh, they had a meeting, I think it was in April, where they invited, uh, mm-hmm. they originally sent out letters, I guess. They invited me back. I didn't come because uh, I was getting ready to go play football. Mm-hmm. So I didn't actually come to that meeting. And my, I, I didn't have, I wasn't in, involved pretty much at all when they first launched mm-hmm. that. I had, I had already left. And then I, I got drafted that, I left in December, I got drafted in January. Mm-hmm. And then I went to Detroit uh, for the, for the summer camp, so I wasn't really part of the initial launch of the uh, the national mm-hmm. society. What did you think about it? Oh, no, I, was, I thought it was great. I, I still never knew that it was <laughs> where it was going to end up. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I, I thought it was, I thought it was great. I thought, and, and they used the model that we started, you know, other other universities. Mm-hmm. No, I thought, like like I said, everybody you know played a role. I thought that that was a a great. You know, they deserved tremendous credit for it. Mm-hmm. it was, that, that it, uh, it took off. Mm-hmm. And, and it your was, sister Michelle Cooper served as a Nesby leader as right. well. Yeah, she came. She came to Purdue in 1977. So she she was actually more involved in the national launch. Mm-hmm. Her and Virginia. You know, I heard stories. You know, I didn't know what, how much work they were putting into it, traveling around the different colleges, you know, selling the the model to different colleges when they. After that initial meeting, mm-hmm. yeah, she she was very much involved in that. She was the was it the national secretary or secretary, I guess, right? Who? Oh, M- M- Michelle. Either, Michelle. Yeah. Oh, I I'm not sure which position she, she was held. either national secretary or national treasurer. Okay. But she was she was working along with uh, Virginia Booth, traveling mm-hmm. around to different universities. Okay. Yeah, you know, it was it was trying to implement the vision around the country. Mm-hmm. And did she get involved in SB, or how did she get involved in SB? Do you know? Oh, well, she knew about it through me. So okay. when she came, and then Virginia also was. She was. She played a big role. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And now, so I know you mentioned that you kind of brought them your own personal mantra of everyone must graduate, and mm-hmm. we're getting out of here, <laughs> you know, into the Black Society of Engineers, mm-hmm. and now that current mission of the National Society. Mm-hmm is much longer (laughs) and it's to increase the number of culturally responsible black Mm -hmm. engineers who excel academically succeed professionally and positively impact the community Mm -hmm. so how do you think the current mission compares to the goals of the chapter like when you were involved Mm -hmm. yeah i can i can see how they would come up with that mission now in terms of trying to expand the appeal more i think to um you know, more culturally and more into you know, like corporate America. I, I still feel you can't. For, one of the things that you know, it's, it's almost like starting a starting a business. 
know, if you grow too fast, you sort of forget you know, what makes you successful, what if you get your roots and you sort of get diluted. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, um, <clears throat> so again, I, I'm, I had no issue with the, with the mantra, but again, what their new mission statement is. So again, when I came back a few years ago, I, you know, my message to the Mesby people at large, and that was the students, the administrators, the uh, just leadership, mm -hmm. was don't forget what made Mesby successful in the first place. And that is a support group for each other to make sure that everybody who gets into the program graduates. If you know, if you if they start trying to form too many groups that don't don't, don't have the roots to support networks, mm -hmm. and then uh, I think you would dilute the effectiveness of it. And when I say the roots, I mean going down a grade school and high school, make sure people have the right foundation. So that when they get into the program, they can they can graduate. You know, they, we only had a few officers, a few positions you know, when we first started. As you start, there are a whole lot more roles now in that. Mm -hmm. And if you start taking, I know how much time it took me. Okay, you know, everybody wants to contribute, and everybody does play a role. But my parents used to always tell me, "Don't forget while I'm while I'm down here." So if you know you, you can be the president or you can be whatever role you're going to play, but if you want to play, but if, it, if you can, if you do all that and you don't graduate, then, then you haven't accomplished mm -hmm. what the real goal is. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So that's, that's, that's why, you know, again, I, again, that, I think that's a, it's, it's a good a mission statement to, you know, broaden the, the appeal to a larger audience. You still have to have, I think, the, the foundation. Mm -hmm. And it starts with, your whole point is, you know, you're trying to graduate. That's, right. That's, that's, mm -hmm. if, you that's graduate, if you don't graduate, if you don't graduate, then... We haven't increased the number. <laughs> right. And they got, new, they got new challenges now. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, the biggest challenge that I didn't have, not only because I was on a football scholarship, but also because the cost of education has gotten so, so high. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people can start... This, this is probably a good example, a specific example... A lot of people can st start the program and they're they're study every night. They up in the study, but they run out of money because the cost of education has gotten so high. So I think, for example, when they whatever initiatives that they have, the NSB is an initiating now need to make sure that there's funding available to make sure that people can get through the whole program. Mm -hmm. You because. Know, before we people weren't getting through the program because they weren't prepared. Now we, when you run up against, they don't get through it because they run out of money. I, I was I graduated in December '74. I I was able to get an action another year on my scholarship because I was playing football. Everybody doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if you got, for example, extra money to start a new chapter, maybe the, in terms of priorities, make sure maybe it's the best use of that money would be come back and make sure a student that's maybe one semester away or two semesters away gets the funding to finish mm -hmm. whether they may not have if they didn't have access to additional funding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if also if some people feel a lot of pressure to finish in four years. I'm sure you know, you don't have to finish any degree in four years. <laughs> you know, 30 years from now, nobody cares if you, it took you, you know, four and a half years or five years just that you graduate. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's that's the, that's my uh, only comment on, on the mission. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I mean, well, throughout its time, so the name and mission, or however it was defined, uh -huh. always was importantly referenced black engineers. Right. So what does the term black engineers mean to you? Well, I still I still resonate with it. You know, a lot of people start using African American. African -American. I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any problems with that either. Or minority. Again, I came up in the civil rights era, so I identified with the adjective black. Engineers, mm -hmm. but this gets opened up. So uh, yeah, another thing is, um, and it, that's good too. They've opened it up in terms of not just engineers. It's a lot of a lot of ways it, it, it encompasses a whole STEM program, mm -hmm. which is a national, you know, national initiative. So mm -hmm. I, that's good. I mean, the more the more the better. Um, but again, you, you can't dilute. The, you got to uh, personally, you got to keep the. The primary mission, the primary objective in mind. And the Every, roots. Everything needs to. Once you have a, a, a big, 
well developed root system, then you you start growing all the branches. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, the branches aren't going to be be that strong. Right. So, in what ways has your interaction with Nesby changed over time? Well, thanks to uh, well, again, I, when I first you know first left, I was coming back on a regular basis, giving talks to uh, say grade school and high school students. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended some some national organ uh, conferences over the years, not necessarily on a regular basis. In the last, you know, probably three or four years, I've gotten more involved. You know, thanks to Virginia, she's sort of gotten more involved. <laughs> but now, I, you know, I I went to uh, you know, the, the national conference in, in Boston most recently. You know, I've been going to conferences before throughout the years, and I was recruiting. Uh, I was going. I was recruiting for Purdue when I was at, in corporate America. And I'm trying to recruit from Purdue to corporate America because I was doing that. But um, when I went to Boston, I sat in some of those the sessions, and it, you know, people would come up to me and say, "You know, thank you, thank you for starting it." I mean, it sort of just hit me then I, the impact that Nesby's had on people's lives mm -hmm. that I had. I had. I mean, I, I knew I could. I could think about it intellectually. I could see it emotionally when I was, you know, talking to people when I was in Boston most recently. I mean, mm -hmm. people said that I would, they didn't even think they could go to college, let alone major in engineering, you know, and get the support and the financial support. And so that was that was actually pretty touching, to, mm -hmm. just seeing the impact. And besides, I was always amazed how how large Nesby had grown. But talking to individuals and that, you know, hearing tell me what the impact Nesby had on their lives. Mm -hmm. yeah, was, that was, uh, yeah, that, that made me think, and that was, that was a touching moment, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... I can't say I, you know, I took it for granted, but that didn't... <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't but hit I, you in I, the... Yeah, but I took it for granted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what that impact really meant for people. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. So now I, you know, I'm, you know, I... I'm, um, I'm, I'm, you know, say I'm. I was always, you know, motivated. I'm, I guess I'm re-energized with the, you know, what's going on now, mm -hmm. with you know, being more involved in Nesby, and you know, being able to like, sit down, you know, talking to you now. Just trying, and I think it's important to people to understand you know, what we were going through at the time. You know how we dealt with it. I think it's important for people to understand how it, how it actually started, mm -hmm. so that gives them a, a better perspective. So. No, they they don't take it for granted, right? Right. <laughs> so, kind of looking back, I mean, you, you touched on this a little bit just now, mm -hmm. but over your personal and professional life, like, would you say the Black Society of Engineers, that's now the National Society of Black Engineers, mm -hmm. had a significant role in who you are today? Oh yeah, I one thing I sort of left out. Actually, when I left, I, I went. I played football when I left Purdue initially, but. Once I started working in corporate America, I actually took the same things we were doing in Nesby and took them to corporate America in a different kind of context. Mm. I started groups, and I started with AT and T. I started, uh, you know, sort of leadership roles within AT and T. We call them diversity groups, yeah. mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we we get we set up meetings with senior leadership, and we we would I would uh, or we you know, we would we actually had consultants come in and talk to senior leadership. And trying to convince them the the benefit of setting goals to get more minorities in. Mm. Our, I spent a lot of years in AT and T doing that, and it was essentially a carry up. Uh, it was essentially a continuation of what I had started doing in Nesby, because well, minorities were just starting to get into in white colleges. They still hadn't progressed up the corporate ranks in any great numbers when I started working at AT and T. Mm -hmm. So that was I spent a lot of time with that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that that was taking them throwing a lot of you know the presentation was different, but the, the goal was the same, trying to, to convince corporate America what the benefit was to having a diverse way of thinking. You know, back then we were we were also talking about uh, women, not just uh, blacks or minorities. We were just talking about uh, diversity in, in thinking. So that that was sort of the, that was the pitch back mm -hmm. then. Okay. But yeah, I was yeah I was very actively involved in that. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so what advice would you give to a Purdue Nesby student now who desires to be successful or even exceed what you have achieved? Mm -hmm. uh, just everybody plays a role. I mean, I played a role. Uh, just to instill on them that you're playing a role. Uh, you're playing a role in Nesby in terms of you, you may not think it, it could be something that's it could be doing a task, it could be moving something, or it could be just as simple as being a role model. You know, being a role model is is important. Also, it could be somebody in your family, you know, somebody outside your family, or somebody in the community mm -hmm. that uh, you all play a role. No, no matter how insignificant it may seem to you, I, mean, I never knew Ed and I never knew that next people grow like it. You know, but just keep moving things forward, and, it's, and you never know what's where's going to end up. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and how do you think Purdue can continue to contribute to student success across the board and then particularly with black engineering students? Yeah. Well, actually, I've got to say, I mean, me, I'm actually proud of Purdue. You know, they've, you know, I, I think I've mentioned to you in the email, they, they've come a long way. I mean, and then they've embraced diversity all along the way. They haven't, they really haven't hesitated. I mean, they've, I've seen, you know, quite a bit of change and one great thing they're doing in the last five years in a row they haven't increased tuition and that mm -hmm. goes a long way mm -hmm. <laughs> it's something, you know, something like that based on what we were talking about before so I think I think that's great I think uh, the support that they are seeing I think that the uh, the benefit that they're seeing and the support is they're providing to the minority programs in Purdue I think uh, just just reinforces the, the importance of it. So I, th I think uh, they're doing a, a great job. You know, just don't stop. And I have a new role. You know, it's, I'm seeing what you know what perspective I can bring to the national, the um, Purdue Engineering Alumni Association. Mm -hmm. So uh, I listened. I listened to Dean Mung's vision of uh, for the dean, for the School of Engineering. Uh, a couple of months ago, so part of that mission to that uh, group is to help implement his vision, mm. and and <clears throat> I've already you know minorities would, would continue to be a focus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know I want to bring that perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, continue to reinforce that perspective you know, to the in the school of engineering. Right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. One one of the things I. I did here in Virginia. I talked talk, talk to her. Uh, they they're talking about uh, taking away her that role. Which role? The, the minority engineer uh, program role. Oh, I don't know any details you know, about okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that role is important. So. Mm -hmm. I'll okay. continue to beat the drum on that. <laughs> yes, it is important. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's not just it's not just Purdue. It's other other colleges are. It's some, some murmuring going on that that's what people are thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'll continue to beat the drum of how important that role is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> many of us students appreciate that you're beating that drum. Because <laughs> yes, it is, it is something right. that's a conversation happening nationally at different right. institutions mm -hmm. about the need or role of where should a diversity officer stay? Do right. they need to have a diversity officer in any, right. in any place? So mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, what I can probably understand what the, the thrust of it is, they're lumping all minorities into one bucket. Mm -hmm. But each each culture has different needs. Mm -hmm. so they, have, they have to have to have a way to be identified as being separate. Right. If you lump them all together, then it, then it gets diluted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't get the power <laughs> and strength of having the diversity right. in the first place. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so I just have some like reflective questions now. Uh -huh. um, now that your memory has been jogged. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But how do you think your collegiate experience would have been different if the Black Society of Engineers idea never came off the ground or mm -hmm. just didn't happen? Uh, you tell personally? Yeah. Well, well actually, it, you know, it gave me a sense of purpose. So if whenever you have a sense of purpose, mm -hmm. it, helped, it helped me get through school. Help me get through. I had other support, but it was one extra thing to help me get through Purdue mm. in, in a positive way. You know, I had football, I had my parents, you know, my background, but the fact that time in engineering just gave me more more drive mm. to. And 
it also is giving me, like now, I'm, I'm, I'm more compelled to, you know, help somebody else along. So that's this other thing. It's, it's giving, it's giving me more initiative, giving me more fulfilling of the need to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, and in what ways would you say your experiences at Purdue in general continue to shape who you are and what you do today? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's well the biggest thing you know, my, you know biggest experiences in Purdue was was, was football and, mm-hmm. and, and National Society of Black Engineers. But just as an opportunity to just get to go to college, just you know, college life. You know, you can't say it would have been. I still would have gone to college, but. It 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 uh, shaped me and you know it's going through the engineering program. You know I think it prepared me for for that that field, and I, and I felt uh, I felt well equipped. I felt well equipped when I graduated from Purdue that I could be successful no matter what I did. Mm-hmm. Like like I mentioned, uh, going through the Purdue's engineering program you know, taught me how to think differently. I became a problem solver. I was in the technical field when I first started working in corporate America, but then I went to the business side. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I was able, I felt I was able to, you know, to do that, you know. <laughs> and part of my attraction, what I'm doing now, I, I spent the last uh, t- 15 years of my career in corporate America. On the business side, the commercial real estate broker is sort of lend itself to that, where, you know, return on investment analysis really the, that's the thing that, the analytical thinking, Mm-hmm. It's the thing that why I'm able to do that. Okay. But it all started from it. All, it always starts from a back your background, and you keep building. So Purdue was actually Purdue allowed me to continue my discipline. Mm-hmm. You know, sort of you know create create the environment mm-hmm. to uh, uh, you know you know bring out more of who I am. And mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't. I didn't have to. Like I say it was, it was it was a supportive environment. I didn't. I wasn't fighting. You know, I was. <laughs> there was no. You know, I mean, there were obstacles in terms of me, like it is. But it, there weren't any artificial obstacles trying to you know, get in the way of me accomplishing what I wanted to do. What's an artificial obstacle? Like, what do you mean by that? Well, like you know, like a distraction. Like I didn't have to worry about uh, you know feeling that I was being discriminated against, for example. Mm-hmm. I, I felt that what I was doing you know, was embraced versus not embraced. I didn't feel I had to. I, I didn't feel I had to talk anybody into the benefits of this is what I want to do. You know, well, we want to start the black black society of engineers. And it was you know even if we had to we had to do some things, but besides the normal things you have to work through, there were. There were no distractions from you know from the university that prevented right. me from doing it. So, what's a particularly memorable experience you've had or you have from your Purdue days? Mm-hmm. Particular memorable experience. The thing that comes to mind is graduating. <laughs> <laughs> what was that experience like? What did that feel like? It was. I mean, it was. It was at the time. It was. Uh, my biggest accomplishment, mm. and it carried me, you know, carried me through for a long way. I mean, that was, that was what I was trying to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got drafted into professional football. I, you know, I was, but it wasn't. I still didn't have the same feeling that I, when I graduated in electrical engineering from Purdue, you know, while I was playing football. <laughs> was it like did it hit you when you walked across the stage, or was it just when you finished your well, last did, test? Well, actually, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> March and I didn't come back in March. Oh no! Since I graduated. <laughs> okay. And by June I was I was off in camp. I oh. Camp okay. Camp. Oh, they didn't have a December um, ceremony no, they, then. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I would have had to come back in May. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was no. It was actually just when I, when I, said I'm done. When I, uh, I did my last test. Mm-hmm. And they sent me my degree. So what What did that feeling <laughs> feel like? Feel like? Could you describe it? Unbelievable! I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable! I, I just felt the way I really felt was when I came when I first came out of Purdue that all the stuff that the discipline it took to get through the curriculum and mm-hmm. I felt that 
I really, I could deal with anything, and I could deal with anything and what life had to offer. Right. You know, I came in and said, okay, what's, you know, okay. <laughs> Whatever life, you know, that's, okay. <laughs> what else? Mm-hmm. So that's, that was, it gave me a you know, great confidence that I could handle whatever life threw my way. Right. Yes. That's that's cool. Cool. <laughs> and is there anything else you would like to share about Nesby or your Purdue experience that we haven't discussed yet? Mm-hmm. No, no you, you've covered it all. I've talked a lot about it. <laughs> 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 no, no. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I, no, Purdue was a was a positive experience. I got a lot of you know, positive experience. I just I remember when I was thinking about going to like we all do when I was thinking about picking colleges. You know, people give you people whether you want to go to a small school and be a big fish or you want to go to a, a, a big school and be a small fish. You know? mm-hmm. I'm here to tell you, you can go to a big school and be a big fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good goal. <laughs> <laughs> big school, big fish. <laughs> right. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's yeah. been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, back when uh, I first came to Purdue, you know, black people were just trying to assimilate into white colleges or to get the access to the right kind of jobs. You know, the world has changed now. You know, we've, we've assimilated. Now black people have a, a different objective. Now they're you know, they, they own their own businesses, and you know, so the um, so the uh, teaching uh, Nesby besides what the original you know, goal was to make sure you graduate, but in terms of expanding the scope of Nesby, uh, uh, promoting entrepreneurship type of training, that's something that uh, we didn't actually do when we were uh, when we were coming through. But that's something that you know people coming through now they have a more entrepreneurial spirit and they may not just want to come out and get a job they may want to start their own business so that's one of the things that I think Nesby could uh, focus on in the future mm-hmm.